good morning, Grovetown United Methodist Church family and any guests we may have for joining us. If there's anyone who <clears throat> doesn't know who I am, I'm Reverend Sandy Hessler, the pastor at Grovetown United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that we can join together for worship on this day. I would like to tell the Grovetown uh, United Methodist Church family that our leadership team is going to be meeting this Tuesday and we're going to be discussing our plans for joining together in corporate worship uh, and the uh, projected date for that is June 28th. You will be receiving more information in your daily emails. Now, let us uh, attend to what we are gathered here for this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you in a time of turmoil for our nation and our world. Thank you for welcoming us into your presence on this, your day and for offering us a mind of peace. May our service of worship come from clean hands and pure hearts, so that in our time together, we will be acceptable in your sight. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. Prepare our hands to do your work. Grant us your presence and prepare us to be peacemakers and workers for justice in an unjust world. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 145. And uh, we will be hearing verses 8 through 11. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over all creation. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. All the Lord's ways are just, all the Lord's doings are kind. The Lord is near to all, to all who call upon the Lord in truth. The Lord fulfills the desires of all the faithful and hears their cry and saves them. All who love the Lord, the Lord preserves. All the wicked, the Lord destroys. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh, bless God's holy name forever and ever. Blessed be the word of the Lord. And now, let us pray together. I ask you to, to pray with me and uh, to lift up your prayers in agreement because we know that God honors the prayers of his people. Heavenly 
you, Father. We do praise you and thank you for all the blessings of life. Thank you that uh, through technology we are able to meet together even though we are apart. Accept our thanks to you for all that you have given us. And hear our confessions, Lord, for we are a sinful people. We thank you for sending Jesus to redeem us to make us right with you once again. Heavenly Father, I lift up our leadership team who will be meeting on Tuesday and asking to be in our presence and to guide us as we make decisions about reopening our time of worship together while keeping everyone safe. Heavenly Father, I lift up Tina and Ruth, who are in nursing homes, I ask you to keep them safe as well as all of the residents and workers there. And I pray for those who are ill from our membership and all those who are ill throughout this world. And I ask for their healing, Lord. I pray especially for those who are suffering from COVID-19 and for all the medical workers who are ministering to them. I pray for safety and for quick healing and for a cure and a vaccine for this um, indescribably devastating virus that is among us. And Lord, I pray for all of the United Methodists who march on Friday for racial justice. I pray for all of those who are marching in this nation. Uh, to bring about justice to those who have not gotten it for all the people in our nation who are downtrodden and continue to be put down instead of lifted up. Lord, I pray for peaceful marches and for the safety of all. And I ask you now to be in the presence of each one of us because you can be everywhere. All at the same time, Lord, because you are outside of the bounds of space and time. And I pray that you will hear us all as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles with you. We're again in the book of Matthew looking at another parable. And uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity, a few minutes, to look it up. Um, because I have to look mine up, too. I looked at a different page just a moment ago. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to be reading verses 31 through 46. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations, or people, will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from the other as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you 
gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or need you clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This uh, parable, again, is about the kingdom. And it is a parable with some really tough words and some really wonderful words right from the mouth of Jesus. This is a parable that Jesus spoke. Just in the last, uh, the remaining few days of his life before he went to the cross. We know Jesus wasn't wasting any words at that time. Not that he ever did. So these are words that we need to heed. This parable reminds me of something that happened uh, in my life. Many years ago now, I was an undergraduate. I was taking political science, and uh, all of the students had been gathered in the classroom, and we were waiting. And in walked the teacher. This was a man that I had never um, seen before. I'd heard his reputation and heard that his class was pretty tough. He came striding down the middle aisle of the classroom. Uh, wearing his 10 gallon hat and his cowboy boots and carrying a leather briefcase. He looked somewhat like uh, someone out of a men's magazine. He put his briefcase on a desk, took out some papers, put it on uh, the podium that he was speaking from, uh, grasped the sides of the podium, and said, I have something for you. And if you will take it and do what I say, I guarantee that you will have no problem passing this class. And he proceeded to hand out a list of questions. He said, these are the questions that are going to be on your final exam. If you answer them, and if uh, you study them, you will see them again on the final exam. And that was all that he said about that. But I took him at his word. And every day after class, I would go home and take the list of questions and my class notes, and I would write out the answers to the questions, and I would study them along and along. And before uh, the final exam came, I did a lot of studying and uh, was really, really surprised when I went to take the final exam. Um, the next morning, and 
learned that he had been true to his word because, because there on that final exam was a selection of questions directly from the paper that he had given us. I had no problem answering those questions in a short amount of time. And I think shock is uh, an accurate word from what I learned when I saw the post-it grades and saw that there was a range of grades just like in most classes. By the way, I did make an A, but there were many people who made an F. I couldn't figure that out. Not only had our professor given us the questions to the final exam before the class began, uh, he had told us exactly what to expect, and he was true to his word. That's a little bit like what Jesus did with this parable, except Jesus not only gave us the questions, he gave us the answers for the final exam. This is a parable that has always interested me. It has uh, given me time to think about many elements of it. I think the most uh, useful part of this parable is that it tells us that there is going to be a judgment. A judgment not just for a few or some, but for every single one of us. But it's raised some questions for me. Jesus talks about his brothers. And we don't know exactly who those brothers are. And this parable also, if you don't look at it carefully, uh, it seems to indicate that our entry into the kingdom of heaven at the end time is going to be determined by our works. And I had always been interested for a long time about when these sheep and goats were uh, selected in the first place. And we're going to look at uh, the scripture a little more deeply and um, maybe get some answers to those answers to those questions and then look at the parable again as it applies to our lives today. I think we get a better understanding of this parable if we understand something about the first century shepherd and his flock. When sheep and uh, goats are out grazing, they pretty much look alike, even though they have quite a few differences. But many times they are all grazing out of the same pasture, and for a variety of reasons, the shepherd may need to separate the sheep from the goats, especially when they're coming in for the night, because sheep are usually fuzzy and woolly and stay warm, but the goats need a little more insulation. They're not quite as fuzzy as the sheep are. So when it is time for the shepherd to call the sheep home and the goats and to separate them, the shepherd will stand in front of them with his staff and maybe they will be coming through a narrow entrance to go uh, on either side to their particular enclosure. The shepherd will have his staff as the sheep or the goat uh, comes forward, if uh, there's a sheep coming, the shepherd will take the staff and tap the sheep on the right side, and the sheep will go to the right. And the same is true with the goat. The goat will be tapped on the left side and will go to the left. Now, if you'll notice in this parable, um, Jesus does mention the sheep and goats, but he's talking about people. And he says, on the final day, the Son of Man, and we know that is Jesus, will come 
and be seated on his throne to judge the nations, the people, every person who has ever lived, who is living now, who will live, will be judged before the throne of Jesus. And Jesus, in telling this parable, says that the judge is going to separate the people in the same way that a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And we know that this is going to happen at the end time, the time of judgment. So the sheep and the goats have already been decided. The people themselves are the ones who have made the decision about whether they will be sheep or goats by deciding to follow Jesus with their lives or not to give their lives to Jesus and to spend their lives doing what Jesus has said we should do. Going to the right indicated a place of honor. And Jesus said, this is where the sheep or those who are going to enter the kingdom will go. And then he says, go to the right because you have spent your life doing these acts of mercy. You have been feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those in prison caring for the sick. And he says to the goats, you're left. Go left. You're left out of the kingdom because you have not shown acts of mercy. You've not fed the hungry or clothed the naked or visited uh, those in prison or cared for the sick. And I'm sure you noted and have heard this before. Um, after the people who were going to enter the kingdom or not enter the kingdom heard Jesus' words to them, um, each of them was surprised because they did not realize, hadn't thought about when they did or did not do these things. The sheep who were to enter the kingdom said, when? When did we do this? When did we? Um, uh, Jesus said, and when you do this, you do it unto me. And they said, when did we do this unto you? When did we uh, feed you and clothe you and uh, take care of you and show mercy to you? And he said, when you did it to one of these, my brethren. You did it unto me. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture and talk among scholars about who these brothers were. Um, were they his biological brothers? Were they the disciples? <laughs> were they other people who uh, were in the crowd uh, and were listening to his teaching? Now, I'm going to take a broad stroke here and say uh, that I think that we would do well to apply this to everyone. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan when uh, the uh, teacher asked, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus told a story indicating that it is whoever you see that needs mercy. I think that um, Jesus' brethren include all who need mercy. And that's all. The scripture in its entirety shows us that God has mercy for all. Now, we see that Jesus said, you are inheriting the kingdom or not inheriting the kingdom because you did these deeds or didn't do these deeds.
days. Yet they see as if he is saying we can earn our salvation by doing works. But those who were doing the works didn't realize that they were doing it. So they couldn't have been doing those deeds in order to earn entrance into the kingdom. And the same is true. Those who were not doing the deeds didn't know um, why uh, that counted against them. If they had known, surely they would have been trying to earn entrance into the kingdom. The point here is that these acts of love and mercy were an outgrowth or an evidence of these people's dedication to Christ. They were proof that these people at the end time who are going to be judged by Jesus were Christ followers. Their acts of mercy, their clothing the naked and feeding the hungry, etc., showed what was inside of them. It showed their motive for serving others, for they had taken on the mind of Christ. Paul speaks of this in his letter to the Corinthians, when he's talking about people being judged for being a Christ follower, and he says no one has uh, the right to judge you. No one can judge but Jesus and we have the mind of Christ. When we become Christians, we are to let Jesus mold us and change our way of thinking and make us a new creation. Our deeds make a strong declaration. Those who have the mind of Christ serve their fellow humans because they began to think as Christ taught and thought. Those who are Christ followers just naturally show love and mercy and compassion. Those who do not have the mind of Christ are serving themselves. Now, we can see that actions are going to help determine our judgment. Whether we get blessed or whether we were doing right by following Christ and showing mercy. James spoke of this and said there are some people who say, um, I have faith, but I don't have any works. And James says, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. My works, my love, my mercy, my compassion are evidence of my faith in Jesus Christ. These deeds show whose mind we have. Our own natural tendencies are those of Jesus Christ, who transforms us into new creations. We at Grovetown United Methodist Church, even in this time of pandemic, have continued to show mercy, to do deeds of mercy, by um, feeding the hungry, by giving drink to those who are thirsty, by continuing to uh, give to offerings in the North Georgia Conference so that people can be served. Um, we have people who have made masks, people who are checking on their neighbors. We have people who are showing acts of mercy every day, even uh, during this time of difficulty and isolation. And we do it not because we're trying to earn anything. Uh, what I see of our wonderful loving congregation is that we are doing it 
because we have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. If we look at what's going on in the world today, uh, we see that there are a lot of people who are not displaying love and mercy or compassion. We see racial prejudice at, at its worst being demonstrated. We see those who are trying to make peaceful protests uh, being vilified and treated badly. But all alongside that, we see people demonstrating the mind of Christ. We see people who are being peacemakers and who are working to bring about justice without hate and violence. And certainly there are some people who will do good works who may not profess to have faith in Jesus Christ. But certainly, everyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ should be engaged in showing mercy to their fellow human. We see the mind of Christ in the unifiers, the ones who are working to bring us together rather than to divide us. Now, you have the opportunity to make a decision about whether or not to be a, a, a Christ follower. Remember, the end time is coming. And when the end time is here, the verdict is going to be evident by how someone has lived their life. Will they be welcomed into the kingdom or cast into outer darkness? Have you lived your life demonstrating what is right by having the mind of Christ and showing mercy, love, compassion as the natural outgrowth of your gratefulness to Jesus Christ for the great gift of eternal life he has made possible for you? Or will you be left and actually cast into the outer darkness? I invite you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, to believe that he is the Son of God who died on the cross, taking away the sin of the world, and being raised to new life by the Father. And after you accept and believe this, if you have not already, think about what has been done for you and show your gratitude and your love for Christ um, by letting Christ transform you into a new creature and doing mercy throughout the world and all that you do. No one knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming again and time will end. Only the Father. But you have an edge up because not only have you been given the questions to the final exam, you've been given the answer. The answer is to give your life to Jesus Christ and to show that you have done so by the deeds that you do. And we are told that the end will come in the twinkling of an eye. Christ will return. The only time you may have to make that decision is now. I hope you will do that. The bad news in this parable is that there are those who will not follow Jesus and who will, who will be cast into our darkness. But again, for God's people, for those who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and have lived their life for them, the, um, we have the glorious knowledge that we're going to be welcomed into the kingdom of God for eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that 
uh, if there is someone who is listening to this message and they have not yet made a decision to give their lives to you, I pray, Lord, that you will make yourself known to them in a real way right this very moment. And Lord, I pray that you will let them feel your love and mercy and compassion for them. And that they will give their lives to you and live in service for others. For as we do service to others, we do service to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now, if we were in our regular uh, physical worship service together, this would be the time that we take our offering. I want to thank each and every one of you who has been faithful in your stewardship by sending uh, your checks to the church or to Carol, our treasurer, or through um, Bill Pay with your name. In doing this, you continue to support our ministry. And uh, you are the church. God calls us all to be good stewards. Uh, when we give our tithes and offerings, of course, some of it stays in the local church, but some of it goes out into mission across uh, our local area and the state and our nation and even out into the world. So um, I ask you to remember to be faithful in your stewardship. I have a hymn selection. A suggestion for you to listen to today and uh, it, it, uh, in the, the last little part it talks about you know uh, until our life is over reminding us once again that life on this earth does end and there will be a judgment and for all of us God's children um, life will continue in that kingdom forever. This song is There is a Fountain and I suggest that you go to YouTube and look that up. It is There is a Fountain by Anthem Lights. Anthem A-N-T-H-E-M Lights L-I-G-H-T-S There is a Fountain by Anthem Lights. I think it will bring you a continued blessing today. Thank you for having been here. I have enjoyed our time together, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Receive your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Until next week.